Well, it looks like I don't have to tell you who David Brooks is. Uh, the least important thing you'll hear tonight is my name's Daniel Cullen, but it's my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation with uh, someone so many of you know already, and, it, and it's fair to say love. Um, tonight's conversation is part of the 175th anniversary of Rhodes College. I'm told there's a Latin word for that, but nobody can pronounce it, and so we're not, we're not even trying. But what began in Clarksville, Tennessee in 1848 and moved to Memphis in 1925 has blossomed into a place where I like to think a young David Brooks would find the opportunity to experience the kind of intellectual stimulation and moral and spiritual formation that, that he did uh, elsewhere at the University of Chicago, uh, and which he writes about in his, his new book, which we'll be saying a little bit about later on. Uh, that kind of formation, as David understands it, makes you an individual, and that's what we believe in too, but it's an individual who takes personal responsibility beyond the self for friends and family and fellow citizens and even beyond a deep individuality that nurtures creativity as well as rigorous thinking. And all of that um, because of an uncompromising search for truth and, and for justice. And that's what we're trying to do, and that's one reason why I think David Brooks is such an excellent person to have talk with us tonight. We're also celebrating the inauguration of Jennifer Collins, who is Rhodes's 21st president. Um, she is going, she's, she was made president, installed as president in December of 2021. The formal inauguration is going to be in October, but my understanding is that uh, she rules now and her will is. <laughs> so we have a packed house, as you can see. Um, the best part of my day is that I stopped getting tearful, sobbing Instagrams from Taylor Swift about not being able to get a ticket through our online reservation system. <laughs> uh, but you'll understand that we can't pass a microphone around in this, in this crowd without body surfing or something like that. So you were given a card when you arrived. Uh, alas, there is no door prize. But what we'd like you to do, if you want to ask a, a question later on, we're going to reserve some time for audience questions. Uh, write it on that card, print it perhaps, and pass it along to your uh, right to whoever is sitting on the aisle. So I, I have just uh, designated all those people sitting in the exit rows on the aisle as uh, volunteers to just hold the, hold the cards and um, periodically two of my colleagues from the philosophy department will just come by and, and collect them and then uh, sort them. Only, I assure you, to avoid repetition, but they probably will grade down for lapses of spelling, grammar, and <laughs> critical reasoning. <laughs> they just can't help themselves. Well, uh, David, you don't need any uh, introduction. This is your third visit to Rhodes College, which puts you in a very exclusive club. We have one of those Saturday Night Live smoking jackets <laughs> available for you that we will present later. Uh, your first visit was April 2000, when Bobo's in Paradise uh, was just about to come out. And the second was the spring of 2008, during a, another presidential election season. We like to check in with you about once every decade or so to see <laughs> how your own formation just, is Just is the going. same way my kids check in with me every right. day. <laughs> right. So if there's a, a theme to this conversation, and this, as you'll see, <laughs> momentarily is entirely unrehearsed, uh, it's, it's a remark of, of David's 
that our society is over-politicized and under-moralized, and that our politics uh, really is, in, a, in an important way, downstream from culture and, and society. So we are going to get to the politics and the punditry uh, soon, I, I promise. But I think first we ought to explore what, what David believes is more fundamental. And so, David, I want to ask you to think back to uh, your youth when you left the clean streets of Toronto for <laughs> the mean streets of New York with your, your family and eventually made your way to the University of Chicago, the school where fun goes to die famously. <laughs> and I gather it was a perfect match for you. <laughs> and you, while you were there, you did the great books thing, encountered Edmund Burke, were appalled, but then also had some kind of intellectual spark yeah. because of that, and uh, it occasioned a, a shift that made you lean toward conservatism. Could you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Uh, first, let me, uh, I want to offer apologies to, some people saw me at lunch and now are hearing me again. Um, so I would offer apologies in the lieu of a story. I made the mistake of reading my first book in for Audible, for Books on Tape. Uh, and when you read your own book, you realize how boring it is. Um, <laughs> But I did get a story out of it. The sound engineer told me about a novelist who uh, had to read a 900-page novel. And in the middle of the reading, he was crying in a little silent booth there. And the engineer pushed the button and said, is there something I can help you with? And the novelist said, don't I ever shut up? <laughs> and so I'm a little like that today, so my apologies for those who saw me. Um, second, I should say it's my fourth trip to Rhodes because three official visits and once when my son was recruited to play baseball here, which I wanted him to do, uh, he ended up not playing, but it was, uh, it was a, it was a one, one thing I learned about college visits for the parent, A, if you ever want to feel completely invisible, go on a college visit with your kid, uh, and B, whatever school you want them to go to, they will not go to. Uh, so I could have spent a lot of time at Rose if he had made a different decision. But so it's my fourth, and I, but I do remember during my previous trips, I don't know if it was here, but. I remember thinking, Rhodes College has the largest banners I've ever seen in my life. So I, I don't know if you have an identity problem, um, but you are Rhodes College. Um, so I, I grew up um, in a New York intellectual Jewish home. My parents uh, grew up in high school. My dad didn't graduate from high school because he wouldn't swear allegiance to the United States. They met at a college called Antioch College. Uh, which if Oberlin wasn't left-wing enough for you uh, and you wanted a college named after a marijuana bong, uh, that was sort of your place. So we came back and I was living in Greenwich Village and the story I often tell is, my, and it was late 60s, my parents took me to a thing called a bee inn where hippies would go to just be. Uh, and one of the things they did as part of their existence was to set a garbage can on fire and throw their wallets into it to demonstrate their liberation from money and material things. And I was five, and I saw a $5 bill on fire in the garbage pan. And I broke from the crowd, reached in the fire, grabbed the money, and ran away. <laughs> and so that was my first step over to the right. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, I, um, I did go to the University of Chicago. Uh, it was a super intellectual place. My freshman year, um, me and my roommate, we entered him into the Golden Gloves boxing tournament uh, at Chicago. And he had never boxed a second in his life. So we decided to prepare the University of Chicago way. We didn't practice boxing, we just read a lot of books about boxing. And he was called the Kosher Killer. Uh, and his boxing career lasted 19 seconds. So it was, it was not an effective strategy. Um, but I was a lefty. Uh, and I was assigned, I took the Common Core, I had almost no free choices, uh, free courses those first couple years. Mm -hmm. And I was assigned a book I loathed called The Reflections on the Revolution in France uh, by Edmund Burke. And I was a radical revolutionary uh, and I wanted to change the world. I wanted to be a lefty playwright. There was a guy named Clifford Odets who I wanted to be. Uh, and uh, so I was a lefty and I was doing my thing. And then I graduated and became a highly unsuccessful freelance writer for a year. Uh, and then I was a police reporter. 
and I covered a group of projects called the Robert Taylor Homes in Cabrini Green. And these were well-intentioned pro government programs that by the time I got there had turned into absolute nightmares. They were built without consulting the people in the community, and when they tore down the old communities to build up these high rises, they ripped to shreds the social capital and the arrangements people had made to survive. And I had hated that guy, Robert, or, or Edmund Burke, but Edmund Burke was constantly, his mantra was, uh, the world is really complicated. We really don't know much. Epistemological modesty. We just should be very modest about how much we can know about the world. And if you try to upend the world and plan it through some advanced rational plan, you'll probably end up causing amazing harm. And so I um, thought, wow, that guy I hated might have been right about something. And it really opened my eyes because I never met a conservative. I never considered any of that. Uh, and then an event that had happened three years before, well, two years before, uh, I was a humorist for the school paper. Uh, and uh, William F. Buckley, the conservative columnist, came to campus. And I wrote a mean parody of him for being a name-dropping blowhard. Uh, and there were jokes in it like, at Yale, Buckley formed two magic magazines, one called the National Buckley, one called the Buckley Review, which he merged to form the Buckley Buckley. Uh, and it was just like mean about him. And he came to campus and he, get, he said, David Brooks, if you're in the audience, I want to give you a job. And so that was my big break. Um, now, sadly, I wasn't in the audience. Um, <laughs> but that's because I was out debating Milton Friedman on national TV. And so they, PBS hired me to go to California to Stanford, where they was. And I was then a socialist. He was a Nobel Prize winning free market economist. And guess who won those debates? Uh, but I had never encountered a, a free market economist before. So th three years later, after I had this more conservatizing experience, I called Buckley and said, is the offer still open? He said, yeah. So I went to work at National Review. And that really introduced me to this tradition. And so it's an intellectual tradition that to me, I'm, I hesitate to do this in front of an actual political theorist. But the dumb story I tell is that we had the revolution, we had the religious wars of the 17th century. They were just vicious. There was, the, Europe was just coated in blood. And there were two reactions. Uh, one, which we would call the French Enlightenment, was that religion was somewhat dangerous, we should rule by reason. And the other, which we would essentially call the Scottish or English Enlightenment, led by people like David Hume, was that, well, we've got to get rid of all that bloodshed, but we don't trust reason. Reason is not to be trusted. What is to be trusted is your sentiments. Hume wrote, reason is and ought to be the slave to the passions. But the thing is your emotions have to be trained through custom, through tradition, through institutions, through family. And that really became the core of what I believe in, that I distrust, I distrust reason, but I trust well-educated sentiments and emotions. That when we go through life, you meet a fair figure like Dorothy Day, this Catholic social worker. Uh, you meet the Pope or see the Pope. And you have an aesthetic sense that something morally admirable is going on here. And that, to me, is a very trustworthy sense. And so I began to follow this tradition. And Burke was in this tradition. And I fell in love with it. And I fell in love with the reverence for the past it implies. Those who do not look past, look past to their ancestors will not be able to look forward to posterity. I fell in love with the idea that we're a, a chain of, we're just a part of a long chain of conversation between the dead, the living, and the unborn. Uh, I fell in love uh, with the idea that, uh, that we can aesthetically admire to what Burke would call chivalry, which I would just call a moral ecology that encourages us to admire what's worthy of admiration. And so I really, and partly I grew up in a super Anglophilic home. My, my two turtles as a kid were named Israeli and Gladstone, so. Um, <laughs> but it tapped into something deep. And so that's a, a reverence for the past, a reverence that we're stewards of the past, we're inheritors of the past, and all we do is try to change it incrementally, but gradually, but constantly, and pass it forward. And that made me an old-fashioned conservative. But I am an American, and uh, that's not all I am. I also, my other hero is Alexander Hamilton. And Hal Alexander Hamilton is a Puerto Rican hip hop star from the Heights, uh, <laughs> as you know. But he believed in something a little different than Burke. He believed in social mobility, 
in creating dynamic capital markets so that poor boys and girls like him could rise and succeed. And so those were my two heroes, and they sit in tension to him. But there's no such thing as global conservatism. There's only national conservatism. Each nation has its own flavor. And so to me, the American flavor is an uneasy tension between the reverence for the, the past, the tradition, the things that have worked, and the love of a capitalist dynamic economy. Uh, and so I was very happy to sit in that tradition. And I think that tradition runs from uh, Hamilton, then through the early Whig party, Daniel Clay, Daniel Webster, or uh, not Daniel Clay, well, whatever, um, Henry Clay. Uh, and it goes up to Abraham Lincoln, who was a Whig. And Lincoln, ga Lincoln gave more speeches on banking than he gave on slavery over the course of his life. He believed in creating dynamic economies where poor boys like him could get off the farm. And then it follows with Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and then I think it leads to John McCain. And now there are six of us left. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> they're like, it's sort of that old fashioned conservatism. And I, I still believe in what I believed in at 25. But American politics has essentially extinguished the tradition I believe in. Yeah, so let me ask a little bit more about the, the what you call the striving dimension of American life, which you say is quintessentially American. I mean, you, you captured that, it seemed to me, in your first book, Bobos in Paradise, which was laugh out loud funny. Uh, and you, you explained that your genre was comic sociology, and, and it really was uh, in that book and the, and the sequel on Paradise Drive, how we live for now, the future, always, now yeah. we always have. Um, so you were well on your way to becoming the John Milton of comic sociology, <laughs> but, but those were really serious books. And here's what you said in... in uh, Bobos in Paradise of the bourgeois bohemi bohemians who uh, desire success but also like to think and live in terms of uh, 1960s counterculture values. You wrote, they are the new establishment. Their hybrid culture is the atmosphere we all breathe. Their status codes now govern social life for all of us. Their moral codes give structure to our personal lives. And then at some point that you certainly can identify, but you concluded the Bobos broke America. What, what happened? And um, what, is the, what is the thing that went wrong with this, I think you, you call it a meritocratic vision that at first, it seemed to be, you know, one of the two, one of the two vital strands of, of American life, the other being the social foundation. Yeah, so th that book came out. I, I went to high school outside of Philadelphia, and it was um, a town formerly run by the WASP aristocracy, Catherine Hepburn types. Uh, Digby Boltzell would be a sociologist who wrote about them. So they were uh, super upper crusty George H.W. Bush types, basically. And that was the establishment in the 1950s white wasp guys, if you, were, if you went to Harvard, if your dad went to Harvard in 1950, you had a 90% chance of getting in. That was the establishment. Uh, and uh, you had the median SAT scores at Harvard were like 550. It was, you, you earned your way in by get, being blood and born into the right families. And then I went away for five years to cover the, the end of the Soviet Union, and I came back and the town had changed. There was a, a store called Anthropology I was like, who the heck names that store after an academic discipline and then spells it in a French way? Like, what the heck? <laughs> and then there was a, a, an early version of Whole Foods. And then I looked around the kitchens, and everybody had these sub-zero refrigerators, because zero wouldn't be cold enough. Uh, and they had the organic this and the nubby Peruvian fabrics. And so basically, it was a merger of the bohemian hippies of the Bay Area with capitalism. And the information age basically regards people with high education with money. And they want to spend ways in money that demonstrate they haven't sold out to the establishment. And so I wrote Bobos in Paradise about that class. And then I moved out to the exurbs where I, I really it was a celebration of the pioneer spirit that I found in big box malls. 
Like, and I, I you know, go to big box malls, we think like they're tacky, Bed Bath & Beyond, linens and things, that kind of thing. I found it exciting, like the growth, the vitalism of American consumer culture. And you know, you go into the Costco and there's like 30 pound bags of tater tots and <laughs> package of 14,000 Q-tips and like these gigantic quantities. And I used to think, who comes here? I have here? all these at home. You have them yeah, all? I do. Yeah. Well, I, 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 well, this probably didn't apply to you. I would go to these stores and think, who comes here shopping for condoms? Because the quantities are gigantic. <laughs> uh, so that's the optimism of America, a lot of optimistic people. Um, and so that, but that was a period in American life where of relative domestic tranquility. The 1990s, where we'd won the Cold War, politics was George H.W. Bush or Bill Clinton. Uh, and it was a time of relatively good feeling. Uh, and then gradually things begin to go south. And so my main explanation for that, there are a lot of reasons why our politics has taken the turn it has, but the turn it's taken is not only an American problem, it's a Western problem. And in all cases, in my view, this bobo class, these bourgeois bohemians, or some people call it the creative class, they get married, and we used to cover the, uh, the New York Times wedding page, which I call the mergers and acquisitions page, uh, <laughs> is, is Harvard marries Princeton, Goldman Sachs marries <laughs> McKinsey, Magna cum laude marries another magnum cum laude. You can never have a marriage between a magna and a sigma cum laude because the tensions would be too great. Um, <laughs> but it was the educated elite marrying each other. And then investing millions of dollars in their kids. There's a book by a guy named Daniel Markovitz that the average college age parents invest the equivalent of $10 million in each of their kids. Robert Putnam of Harvard says that um, uh, the average college age parent invests $5,000 per year per kid just in extracurricular activities. So they pass down these massive advantages to their kids. Those kids then go to the same schools, and you get a coterie of elite schools which have more kids from the top 1% than the bottom 60%. And then they marry each other, and they move to a few cities, like New York, San Francisco, Denver. Uh, and so pretty soon you get an inherited meritocracy. You get a Brahmin class. And so when I started to journalism, uh, there were working class guys who were serving as police reporters alongside me. Now, not only are you not a work, high school educated person in journalism, you had better be in the top 50 schools. And if you took, walked in the New York Times or any of our peers and swung an ax in the newsroom, you'd hit eight alumni of the Harvard Crimson, which would be a good idea. Uh, <laughs> and, and so we've become this elite institution. I was at a dinner party with a newsmaker in DC and six journalists and we were sitting around chatting and I asked, somehow the subject of high school came up and their high schools were Andover, Exeter, like Cho, like it was, we have, it was not only elite school colleges, it was elite like elementary schools. <laughs> and so we have created this top 20% class in this country, in Britain, in France, in Sweden, Hungary, and 80% of the country looks at us and they say those people have too much cultural power because we basically control the universities and the media and the arts. They have too much political power, increasingly too much financial power. Uh, and so what used to be there was hostility between the intellectuals and the corporations. Not so much anymore. We all went to school together. And so there have been these populist revolts that have rebelled against us uh, and it's because we basically, and in my business say, if you, we basically told 40% of the country your voice is not worth hearing. We will not hire you, you have no role here. And if you do that to people, people will get pissed off. And so in my view, the populist revolts across Europe and the United States are by and large, not only, but by and large a rebellion against the hegemony of the former bobos, the educated elites. And Donald Trump is the vehicle for their attempt at revenge. And there's a guy named Max Hanath who's a philosopher who says every society has a recognition order. Who gets recognized? And people like me get super recognized. A lot of people, and I haven't heard it yet today, but I go to the Midwest, and it used to be I heard, oh, you guys think we're flyover country. I used to hear that once a day. Now I go to some parts of the Midwest, I hear it seven times a day. And there's just this epidemic of blindness, disrespect, economic inequality, but more status cultural inequality. 
And so to me, Donald Trump and the rebellion is a rebellion against the people I thought once you know, were the enlightened ruling class of society but have become insular. So you're, you're painting a picture, David, of the meritocratic ethos ending in catastrophic social effects, sociological effects, way past comic sociology now. But more recently, you've been writing about something I think that's it's obviously related, but still quite distinct, and that is just the spiritual crisis that has yeah. arisen. Um, and you've, you've talked about this very eloquently in the second mountain. And you could say a little bit about that, perhaps, for folks who haven't read that book or the, or the road to character. But your new one seems, uh, I haven't been able to read it because it hasn't been released yet, but what I gather um, you're, you're focusing on now really is this sort of very personal psychological deficit that we all seem to, to suffer. And I'm, I'm really curious about the, the argument of the, of the book, which is called How to Know a Person, the art of seeing others deeply and of being deeply seen. I'm especially interested in the last part of that, wondering whether, like, is it one art or, or, or two? I, I think I understand a bit about what it might take to help to see others deeply, but I'm not sure I want to be deeply seen. I'm Canadian, I don't have exposure. <laughs> Uh, not just from TSA, but anyway. Um. Well, if you want to be the behold, you have to be willing to be beheld. Yeah. It's a reciprocal thing. So say something about your, your yeah. new diagnosis and, and a bit about... So the, so the sure. one mega trend I'll describe is the, this class thing. The second thing I, I think that's happened simultaneously in American society and not particularly related uh, is the... What I mentioned this at lunch, the, basically the social and emotional crisis that we suddenly find ourselves in the middle of. So I don't know about this school, but almost every school I go to, the mental health facilities are swamped. Rising depression rates, 30% uh, rise in suicide since 2000, much higher for teenagers. 54% uh, of Americans say that no one knows me well. The number of people with no close personal friends has gone up by four times. The number of Americans who rate themselves in the lowest happiness level has gone up by 50%. And you know, I was in Oklahoma several months ago, and I'm giving a talk, and like today, there was index cards, and we're going through the questions, and most of them were about politics or something. And one of them was, um, what do I do? I no longer want to be alive. And so I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to pontificate if I didn't know the person. Uh, but I mentioned that at dinner, and the, one of our guests, house guests, said, well, my brother committed suicide three months ago, and then my best friend took his own life about three months later, and I was on the group call with some friends of mine, and so many people that had contact with mental health issues or even suicide. And so this is just pervasive across society. And so why is this happening? Well, partly it's social media, partly it's economic inequality, where people feel invisible. But one story, and partly it's sociological, where we have less civic structures, we're lonelier. But partly, I think it's moral. Uh, and so our founders had a very low but realistic view of human nature. We're beautifully made, but we're also deeply flawed. And our founders, Madison, Franklin, and Adams, said if we're gonna make a democracy out of these people, we need to do moral formation. We need to train them to have better character so they don't rip each other to shreds. And so moral formation, to me, is three things. It's learning how to restrain your selfishness, Having an institution that gives you an ideal to shoot for, if there's a phrase from Nietzsche I like to quote, he who has a why can endure any how. If you know what your why is, then you can handle the setbacks of life because you know where you're trying to go. And then finally, being considerate to each other in the daily interactions of life. How do you, how do you, like basic social skills. And so their skills like how do you be a good listener? How do you ask for forgiveness? How do you offer forgiveness? If you're breaking up with someone, how do you do it without crushing their heart? Uh, and these are just, how do you sit with someone who's depressed? How do you end a conversation gracefully? These are skills like any skill, any craft. 
And so in my view, these skills, we no longer teach them. We lived in a culture that was obsessed with moral formation until about 1945. And that's because we lived in a culture where people are acutely aware of the idea that uh, people are sinful and need they need to be formed. After the war, a different idea took over, that people are basically good at institutions that are horrible. And therefore, if you think I'm basically good, I don't need to do moral formation, I just need to get in touch with myself. But we left people morally naked and alone and morally inarticulate. You can look at the words that have been used, measured by Google Ingram in our uh, uh, in, our, in our language, and usage of the word bravery, courage, humility, honor, have all, those words have all gone down in usage 50 to 70%. We just don't talk about morality that much anymore. And my students, um, I say, you're great kids, but you're morally inarticulate, and they get it. They don't have categories to explain what it looks like to try to be a moral person. Now, we would not want to go back to the old morally formative institutions of yesteryear, some of them would not be acceptable today. Like one of my heroes is a woman named Frances Perkins. She went to Mount Holyoke. And in 1905, when she was there, one of the rules was, freshmen shall remain silent in the presence of sophomores. <laughs> freshmen shall bow deeply when crossing a sophomore. So that probably wouldn't fly at Rhodes these days. So I wouldn't want to go back. But we, we've got to do some moral formation. And so my book says, OK, we've got this crisis. This crisis derived in part because we just don't know how to treat each other considerately. And it's a crisis derived in part from the fact that so many people feel invisible. I, I go across the country as part of my job and I just see an epidemic of blindness. And it's blacks feeling their daily experience is not understood by whites. As I mentioned, rural people not feeling coastal elites see them. Young kids thinking no one knows them and who go off on these awful shooting rampages because they feel unseen and unwanted by society. Husbands and wives who realize the person who should know them best has no clue. And so the book is an attempt to say, okay, that's the problem. Here's my shot at trying to be contributing to a solution. I'm gonna walk you through the process of how do you get to know another, another human being from your first glimpse to hang in, how do you hang out? How do you have a good conversation? How do you ask good questions? Uh, how do you handle somebody who's really angry with you? How do you sit with someone in depression? And it's, it's basically a step-by-step, step. I'm not a practical guy, but it's meant to be a practical book on how you can walk through life and people will leave you and they'll think, that guy was a good listener. And there will be, in my view, democracy is partly about votes and legislatures, the stuff I cover. But mostly democracy is about human encounter. It's about arguing. It's about compromise across difference. It's about being, seeing people who are radically different than myself and saying, OK, maybe I can't totally understand where you're coming from, but I'm beginning to get you. I show you respect, admiration, and, and reverence. And that's what democracy is. And that level of our democracy has surely been strained to the breaking point. So the book, I'm making it sound like more highbrow than it is because it's really a practical guide, like how do you have good questions? But uh, its ethos is an attempt to be my, part of my contribution to say our, our democracy is in crisis because of an underlying social and emotional crisis. Here's my advice for you how to get yourself out of it and how to get your neighbors out of it. Let me try out, David, two possible criticisms of the argument, which I, I think you anticipated already in, in something you wrote recently, but one of them would be, look, if we're, if we're serious about a remoralization of society and we're going to bring back norms, so we're not wearing hoodies tonight, we wanted to, but we didn't think we should. Um, if, we're, if we're really going to do that, aren't we going to uh, come into conflict with some very traditional classic liberal freedoms? and? run up against the grain of an important strain of our political culture and, and part of our democracy. The, the second, so that would be the libertarian objection, I guess. And the second one, I think, would be, look, if you are serious about repairing the moral fabric, then you have to bring back moral judgment. Um, and moral judgment works through things like stigma. And you know, in 
20 or 25 years ago, Gertrude Himmelfarb, Bill Kristol's mom, great historian, wrote a book called The Demoralization of, of Society, I think it was. And, and she emphasized that, that you know, if we're gonna reverse this, it's, we're gonna have to bring back good stigma, right? So that if, if you lead an irresponsible life, you're, you're going to be called, called out for that. Doesn't that um, threaten, as you said a moment ago, to bring back bad old days and bad old thoughts that we wanted to get, to get beyond a kind of social conservatism that people are gonna, many people are gonna find oppressive. How do you avoid that with yeah. the, so, yeah, the I, art? Yeah, I, I don't think the way to make America uh, better and more peaceful is to do more scolding. Mm -hmm. uh, and so w the way I define morality is, is I follow Iris Murdoch, this novelist and philosopher, and she says most of the, our, most of the times uh, we look at each other with, with egotistic self-regard. I can't see you from the other, I can't see you because I'm so busy see, thinking about myself, and I can't see from your perspective. There's a story about a guy who's on one side of the river, and there's a woman on the other side of the river, and she screams and she shouts over to him, how do I get on the other side of the river? And he says, you are on the other side of the river. Uh, <laughs> He can't put himself in her, her perspective. <laughs> and so to me, the essential moral act is just the very act of making you feel like you're understood, respected, and revered. And so the idea of setting norms about family structure, I'm so far away from that. I think we, we, we can't do that unless people have, feel a sense of existential safety that I'm surrounded by people who basically care and revere me. And, or at least care about me, who somehow have to get a, a sense of where I'm headed. And so to me, when I think of a moral act, it's moments when people felt deeply seen. Like, a, a, I'll just give you a couple small examples. Uh, a friend of mine, his daughter was in second grade, she was struggling, and the teacher said to her one day, you know, you're really good at thinking before you speak. And that comment took what she thought was her social awkwardness and turned it into a strength. And the, the act of seeing another human being is a highly creative act. It brings the other people into being. If you see potential in me, I will see potential in myself. If you wrap me in an enveloping gaze, I will feel lovely. Another little example is um, a woman told me a story. Again, these are not big epic stories. She was a homeless, she worked in a homeless shelter and it was early pandemic, she was exhausted and she came home weeping. Uh, and she uh, sat down and her husband just sat next to her and said, here are the six chores I'm gonna do while you're slammed at work. Didn't say anything else. So she, she, she felt he knows exactly what I need. To take it on a bit of a grander scale, there's a woman in Holland uh, named Eddie Hillesom, who was a Jewish woman who grew up in the 1930s. The Nazis take over and you read her diaries, she's a, um, a self-absorbed, spoiled little girl, teenager, or a young woman, she's in her 20s. And the diaries are all self-absorbed. You wouldn't know the Nazis had taken over the Holland because she's all about herself. But slowly over time, she begins to look at the people around her. And some people are disappearing. And she develops, a, and suddenly her, her journals change. So she suddenly, um, I, I should mention she's Jewish. Uh, she's suddenly writing about the other people and what they're going through. And then she has this experience where she felt she was forced down on her knees in prayer. And she writes, I feel like I'm a kneeler in practice. I don't know what I'm doing here, but I feel compelled to pray. And then rather than try to escape the Holocaust, she works at the a work camp where they're sending the, the Dutch Jews before they send them to Auschwitz. And she becomes, and you see it in her diaries, she becomes an other-centered, glorious person who is caring for everyone else and really bathing them in an enveloping gaze. And her biographer said she transformed herself by being acutely perceptive about others. She would look at the bend of their neck, the anxiety in their face, and it was that other-centered attention that created an inner transformation in herself. And so by the end, she's, she's a gloriously bright person. She's stuck in this concentration camp 
writing about the spiritual depth and joy she feels. And so she, and there's a woman named Sivone Vey who had a similar story, and they argued that attention is a moral act, and, they were, and as Iris Murdoch said, we can grow by looking. That the great moral acts, which the, mor the male moral philosophers imagine, which are about building vast moral systems, are not the key. The key are the systems of care that intersect all of our lives. And so Iris, it's no accident that Iris Murdoch was a woman, that Ellie Hillison was a woman. They were acutely aware of the systems of care and how you manufacture those systems and how you maintain those systems. And so to me, I don't think we should or would or I would not want to remoralize society by redefining what is or is not marriage. <laughs> to me, that's just asking for trouble. But if somebody can, I could, you know, one, if I can sit on an airplane with a, a guy and I can ask him about, well, how are you, what's your ethnic culture? What's, how, what's your ancestors? How does that shape who you are? Who was your childhood? Uh, how'd you get your values? To me, that, that's enough. That, that's a way to create some sense of shared purpose and solidarity in life. That to me is the foundation of a kind of public morality that can exist in a pluralistic society. Better that happen than fight over your tray tables impinging on my, my space. <laughs> there is, I should say there's a, a friend I got to know named Nick Epley who's at Chicago who's a social psychologist. And the number one thing that you can do, anybody can do to make yourself happy is to have conversations with people. And so he's, in, he's on a train, a commuter train, going up to school, and he looks at the commuter train. Nobody's talking, everybody's on their screen. And so he decides, I'm gonna do an experiment. I'll pay people $50 to talk to the person next to them on the commuter train. <laughs> and then he interviews them afterwards, and they all say, this was a much better ride <laughs> than if I'd just been in the newspaper. I had so much fun. And he said, we're really bad at predicting how much we will enjoy having conversations with strangers. We're really bad at predicting how much we want to go deep. Uh, and so I have another friend, Dan McAdams, who works at Northwestern. He studies how people tell, narrate the stories of their lives. Uh, and he calls people in and he, to the, his office. He says, tell me about your life, your high points, your low points, your turning points. And after four hours, he hands him a $500 check. Thank you for your time. And the people say, I don't want your money this is the best afternoon I've had in 10 years. Because <laughs> people love to talk about themselves. Uh, as a journalist, I can tell you, how often does somebody say to me, none of your damn business? I ask them, how was your relationship with your mother? No, they, they, they will talk, they will tell. No one has ever asked. No one ever says no. Because people are dying to tell their stories. It's one of the most pleasurable things we can do. And so to me, that's the, I'm, I'm not worried about what marriage is or what marriage is not. I just want to establish some basic level of, of equality of respect in society. Well, speaking of people who like to talk about themselves, let's shift to politics and, and politicians. <laughs> and I'll remind you to, um, if you have questions you'd like to submit, my colleagues will be, will be gathering them up. Um, A few years ago, there used to be this thing that people would, would do as a social outing. They'd, they'd go and get locked in a room and have to figure out how to escape. I think they were called escape rooms. It never struck me as fun, uh, <laughs> but, but people, people did it. Two-thirds of the country or more does not want a Trump-Biden <laughs> rematch. Um, but there seems to be no way to avoid it. Is there? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's just a remarkable situation where we find ourselves in, um, where we're about to walk into an election that, not, that almost nobody wants. Uh, my own view, and I'm, I'm beginning to rethink this, my own view has been, it's gonna be Biden, just accept it. And I say that as someone who um, spends some time around Biden. And if you watch Biden on Fox News, you think he's this doddering old grandpa. I can assure you he is not that. Uh, he is, uh, I've known him for 30 years. I almost wrote a book about him 30 years ago. And he's like a pitcher who used to throw 93 who now throws 85. So he's not where he was. 
but he's still throwing 85. And in some ways, he's better because back when I knew him 30 years ago, if you asked him one question, he felt he had to cram every bit of human knowledge into that answer. <laughs> there was a story when he ran for senator when he was 29 from in one of the Wilmington, Delaware papers, does Joe Biden ever shut up? <laughs> I once went to a lunch with him when he was in the Senate, and they ushered me into his little dining room in his Senate office. I sat there, he sat down, started telling me stories. 90 minutes passed, he tells me story, story, story. Uh, his staff comes in, you've got to go vote center, he leaves. I realized I had an entire lunch, I did not say one word. <laughs> he was entertaining, I liked sitting there, but, but now he's disciplined. People underestimate how much he has a chip on his shoulder. Uh, those Obama people looked down on me, they thought I was nothing because I went to the University of Delaware. Uh, and all those people are looking down on me, but actually I know this job. And I know, uh, I know what I'm doing. I'm better than anybody else at this job. I'm doing a really good job. And around the White House, he is a, not a kindly old Gramps. He's a mean guy. We think of him as this, like, Joe, Uncle Joe. But if you work for Uncle Joe, you have been screamed at. Uh, he, he's a tough guy who was running that White House, for sure. And I go in there, and the, the only difference I'll say is a colonists like me get to go in. And with a, with some, every president has their own, interview, their own way to meet with us. So with Bush, you would meet in this thing called the Roosevelt Room, uh, which is sort of a table for maybe 16. And we, he would go around and ask each of us a question, and we'd all get one question. It would be this rigid thing. And he would give one clear answer, boom, 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 boom. With Obama, it was a three and a half hour gab fest with all of us just shooting conversations and him defensively answering them. Uh, and it, it was kind of fun though. Kind of, he could get a little long winded himself. I remember once I, I met Bono in the waiting room in the White House and then I got called in to talk, be with the president and he was kind of boring that day. And I was like, could I go out and talk to Bono? Like, <laughs> um, and then, but with Biden, He'll only meet with, uh, I think he only meets with very few of us because the Biden administration is insanely closed and overprotective. So you go in there and you, there are four of you and you're in the Oval Office, he's behind the big desk and he's got a team of staff behind you. And I think that team of like 15 senior staff are there like in case he needs them. And so he's fully running the White House but he's surrounded by this cocoon of people who are afraid he's gonna say something stupid. And I think they've done him an enormous disservice because everybody thinks he's actually older than he is. Now, will he be uh, as with it as he, was, as he is now in four years? Well, that I don't know. That, I, I would like to see, I would, I'm actually gonna do this. I'm gonna call up a bunch of doctors and aging experts and say like, what are the odds here? Because I do, like a lot of people, every time he's on a live event, I hold my breath because one, Snafu, one pause, one Mitch McConnell-like moment, and it's curtains. But the problem is there's really not a clear alternative on the Democratic side, in my view. Uh, Kamala Harris would be, what everyone thinks of her, she would be less formidable electorally than Joe Biden. You can imagine some ideal Democrat who should run against them and sort of beat him in the primary, but I can't name that person. It's not obvious who that person is. Uh, and w once you start a primary, it can spin wildly out of control, and the Democratic Party is perfectly capable of spinning too far to the left. And Joe Biden at least has the advantage of um, not liking the Bobos. <laughs> he at least has the advantage of being fundamentally oriented toward the working class of all different races. And if you look at Bidenomics, the infrastructure bill is massively giving money to People, men and women with high school degrees who are gonna work on the infrastructure projects. The Inflation Reduction Act, 80% of the money goes to counties with below median incomes and below median educational levels. The Biden administration is spending enormous amounts of money on Trump voters, which is I think what he should be doing to make the country more equal. And we now are in a situation where the American economy, I think, is doing quite well. In 1990, the American economy and the European economy were like here. Now the American economy is up here and the European economy is down here. 
we're just zooming, we've got one of the healthiest economies in the world. China looks like they're stagnating. And the best part about the American economy right now is that wages at the bottom have been going up. Inequality has stopped growing and maybe is coming down a little. And if you look, there's a map of the 150 biggest investment in plants uh, in this country. $150 billion, uh, or over a billion dollar investments in a plant, or two billion, or seven billion. Where are these plants? Well, there's two in California, but there's six in Iowa. There's five in Illinois. Ohio has new investment plants being built right now, seven billion from Intel, Google, Meta. They're all going into these places that were left behind before. Ohio has more tech manufacturing investment capital, 14 times more per capita than California. And so when I look at the Biden administration, I see uh, an administration that in my view has learned the right lessons from the last 10 years that we've bifurcated as a country and we need to try to economically reunify ourselves as a country. I see an administration of foreign policy that, um, you know, they, the, a lot of people think Biden can't organize a, you know, a picnic, but he did organize the Western Alliance against Ukraine. Uh, and so I, I see an administration that basically puts human dignity at the center of his policies. And so I, I think he, he's, he's a much better president, so he may be old and doddering, but the results to me look pretty good. So even, even if you're correct, David, about the objective situation, and I think you'd, you'd say if there was somebody else with that record who was an incumbent, it would be a lock. Right. Um, the, the fact is it's, it's not working for him. And David Ignatius broke the glass and sounded the alarm recently. It, is it your view that um, that analysis is, is just fundamentally flawed because there isn't going to be a better candidate or there, there isn't the possibility of, of getting another candidate um, at, at this point? I guess what's in the, in the background is the expectation that because for whatever reason, rightly or wrongly, there's going to be a lack of public enthusiasm for Biden among Democrats, the turnout is going to be a problem, and this is going to be yeah. a very close election. Yeah. So is it bottom line, there just isn't anybody better strap in and go with Well, go for with Democrats, Biden. option one is stick with Biden. Yeah. Option two is Biden steps down and go with Kamala Harris. I think that's probably electorally a worse option. Uh, then option three is have both Biden and Harris step down. And if you want to see a turnout drop, try that out. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> because you will definitely see a massive turnout drop if Kamala Harris is not on the ticket. Yeah. And so, and then, so then go to imaginary Pete Buttigieg number four. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy to imagine and it's easy to see the weakness. It's not easy to see a better alternative. Right. Uh, and Joe Biden did actually defeat Donald Trump. Uh, and I'm not sure that a lot of other Democrats know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I'm arguing this case. Believe me, I could argue the opposite case. Mm -hmm. um, why is it that Donald Trump is stronger now than at any point in 2016 or 2020? His approvals are just higher. He's even or slightly above Biden in a lot of the polls. Uh, you know, that he has much more solid ratings on the economy than Biden does. Uh, the basic reason he's doing so well is because of non-white voters. And so he had this huge 70%, or Biden had this huge, or Clinton in those days, had among non-white voters, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, they were like 70% support for the Democrats. Now it's about 53. And so a lot of those, especially working class voters, of people of color, a, a significant share of them, not the majority, a significant share have drifted over to Trump. I think he was better on the border, better on the economy, mm -hmm. better on crime, better on homelessness, and better on the culture. So is the Republican primary over? I'd say 80%, yeah, or 90%. I th I, I'm my own view is that Nikki Haley is the strongest possible anti-Trump person because she's formidable 
she's strong uh, and she's brave. Uh, and her views are a little populist, but not overly populist. Mm -hmm. But uh, all I can do is, you know, they say the polls are too early, but the Trump show has been around for a long time. And there are as many, there are so many people who are, um, there are a lot of, there are a tiny portion of us who have media platforms who are never Trumpers. There are a lot of people out there who are never not Trumpers. Mm -hmm. So if the Republicans don't nominate Donald Trump, they're out. And so the Republicans are as pinioned to their guy as the Democrats are pinioned to theirs. And so, I mean, we can have a 120 year old guy, you know, president of the United States. I, mean, I, I read this book, as apropos of nothing, but I read this book, a uh, biography of Woodrow Wilson. So Woodrow Wilson suffered from a stroke in the White House and hid it from the American people for 17 months while his wife sort of ran the country. So I knew that. But then he leaves office and it's two years later, it's, not, it's early 1924, and his stroke has gotten worse. He's mentally debilitated, he's physically debilitated. And he spends the week of his death writing two speeches. The acceptance speech that he imagines he will give at the Democratic Convention that summer and the inaugural address that he imagines he'll give the following year. So the, lo the point is, what they say about politics, the, the only cure for uh, wanting to be president is rigor mortis. And so these guys just <laughs> never give up. And Woodrow Wilson was like that, but I think Trump and Biden are like that too. They just, they'll never give that up. They, you, they want it so bad. I'm gonna tell one other story that's leaping to mind, a favorite of mine from Bob Dole. After he was defeated in whatever year, 1996, um, he was asked, what's it like to lose a campaign for the presidency? He said, oh, it's nothing. I, I sleep like a baby. I wake up every three hours screaming. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, quickly, David, you, I think at one point you had some optimism for the no labels movement and decided, nah, it's not gonna happen. Um, how worried are you about that right now? Pretty worried. I mean, I, I, there's this thing called no labels, which has a third, they've, they're hiring lawyers to get a third spot on the ballot. And no labels started about 15 years ago as a, a response to the polarization. And they have a thing in the Congress called the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is people who really want to do deals and they practice a kind of politics. And I uh, generally support them. I, I'm, I, my first thought was you can't create a political movement whose first word is no. You gotta be for something and it has to be no. But they've far exceeded my expectations and I'm friends with a lot of them. And in normal, the idea of a, th a third alternative would be my heaven. Because I do think even my little Whig tendency, there's a tendencies in American life that are not represented by the two parties. But now when I look at, um, there's a group in the electorate called the double haters. And the double haters are people who disapprove of both Biden and Trump. And so no labels third party person uh, would be a natural for those, they'd flock to that person. The problem is most no, double haters in the if force between Biden and Trump, they vote for Biden. And so the no labels would draw more for, away from Biden than it would for Trump. I think Trump supporters are pretty locked in whereas a lot of Biden supporters are soft. And so it would just, in my view, it would um, throw the election to Trump. And my, I'm worried about it because while I know a lot of the people there and a lot of the people involved and a lot of the donors, they say, we're not gonna do it if it's gonna help Trump. We re, we're only gonna do it if we think we can actually, our candidate can actually win. If that's not true, we pull the plug. And they've been saying that to me over the past year, but as time has gone on, especially some of the leaders have gotten locked into the mode. And so they've emotionally invested in the thing now They've taken a load of heat from their friends in either of the two parties. And so they've got their battle, their war minds on. And my fear is they're gonna charge ahead. And uh, maybe it'll ups upset the race in ways I don't, I don't anticipate, but I think it's more likely that it'll throw the election to Trump than not. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of questions on um the way in which our politics, and I suppose especially congressional politics, has become performative. Yeah. Um, one, uh, one question is, when do you think that started? And uh, another one is, 
why are we stuck with, with that? Yeah, I have a friend named Yuval Levine who wrote a book, and this is a little related to what I said before. He said universities, institutions used to be formative, that you entered an institution, the Marine Corps, or even the US Congress, and they turned you into a certain sort of person. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Marine, you've been formed by being a Marine. If you went to Morehouse College, you were formed by going to Morehouse College. And it used to be if you were a senator, you were formed by the institution of the Senate. There were the old bulls who sort of ran the place. They insisted that you all behave in a certain way, all that flattery they used to do to each other. There was, a, there was like a pecking order. I used to go to the Senate floor. Uh, and off it, there's a little antechamber where they have a liquor cabinet. And people would be in there, and I'd look at, I'd walk by, and I'd look at the bourbon bottles. And they would go down week by week. People were drinking. Now there's still the bourbon bottles. They're not going down because nobody's drinking. Uh, and so now, Institutions are no longer formative, they're performative. They're a stage upon which you can broadcast your glorious self. And so Ted Cruz comes into the Senate, and a week later he shuts down the Senate. He, thought, he says, I don't have anything to learn from this, this place. I'm going to shut it down, and that way I can go on Fox News. And so basically people run for office now uh, so they can get on TV. And I had a friend of mine who's in the House, a Democrat in the House, said there used to be two kinds of members, the show horses and the work horses. And the work horses did the legislation, the show horses just shot off their mouths. Now it's all show horses. And even AOC said, proved that the way to get power is to get a lot of media attention. And so I think it's shifting a little back, to be honest, in the last couple of years. But, but I would say it began, there are always some show horses but it didn't become universal until the last 10 or 15 years where you could be an utterly unserious person like Marjorie Taylor Greene or a certain senator from Tennessee. <coughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, <laughs> and you don't even have to be serious on policy. I mean, that, it, policy is not a thing. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, um, I was looking at one of the hearings and they had the cameras behind the senators and one of the senators was like taking a selfie of himself while he's interviewing Katanji Brown or whatever, whoever it was, one of the justices. It's like, really? You're, you're tweeting yourself and then you're taking a selfie while you're up there. And, there. and so it's become, it's become complete, complete showbiz. Yeah. And so many of the good people have left. Bob Corker leaves, Ben Sass leaves, Mitt Romney leaves. It's just no fun to be there at all. It's just no fun. So uh, given that you're kind of reconciled to the inevitability of Donald Trump prevailing, um, that must in, mean... In the nomination. That, yeah, right. That must mean you don't think the indictments are going to go anywhere, do you? Well, I mean, they, they've only helped him so far. Um, so, I mean, I, I am upset with the prosecutors because, fine, uh, enforce the law, but one should be aware of the political circumstances which you're operating in. And if you're helping the guy you're trying to prosecute, then you're not doing the country many favors. Uh, and so I assume, well, one of the things that bothers me is right now the Georgia case is scheduled to start on the day before Super Tuesday. And so that means at the very peak of the Republican primary season, the whole party will be rallying behind Donald Trump. That really knocks out the chance for a lot of the others. Maybe they'll push it back. But, and then suppose he gets uh, charged, um, or suppose he gets convicted, uh, what happens then? Uh, and you know, you can run for president from prison, from Eugene V. Debs, the socialist candidate that did so many years ago. Um, maybe they'll convict him and then suspend his sentence till he gets out of the White House. I don't know. I don't know how. I mean, in the Georgia case, which is a state case. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just it's we're putting us our, ourselves. And again, this is a little like AI. I, I spent like a year really learning about AI. I can't make up my mind about AI because the, the future is so unknowable. <laughs> in the same way, you you have four convictions of a president, a guy running for president. I have no idea what that looks like. <laughs> What model am I supposed to use to predict that, that event? I really have no idea what that looks like. But I know 
it looks like mass civil strife if, if he's convicted, and I know it looks like mass civil strife if he's not convicted. And so it's going to be a bumpy ride. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's interesting. There's so many questions that are um, about the sociology and the, and the spirituality more than, more than politics. So I'm going to have to ask you to try to answer these as best you can in like one minute each. Okay. Um, I'll put on my journalist hat and take off my professor hat. Yeah. Um, one is, what do you miss most about Mark Shields? Hmm. That's a I good question. I said one minute. That's uh, a good question. Um, a, a little, uh, just basic, his basic decency. We never had a fight. We disagreed, and then I was super supportive of the Iraq war, and he was super opposed. We never were angry at each other. Uh, second, uh, Mark, um, he, he did the show for a long time. My joke used to be Mark did it with me, Brooks and Shields, or Shields and Brooks. Before that, it was Shields and Jago. Before that, it was Shields and David Gergen. Before that, it was Shields and Coolidge. Before that, it was Shields and Thomas Aquinas. So he did it a long time. But he hearkened back to a working class Democratic Party from Adlai Stevenson to Bobby Kennedy that always had its orientation around the little guy. And Mark always had his orientation around those who needed the help most. And it, that was just who he was, the family he came from, uh, and, and always a, a sense of compassion and contempt for anybody who was in it for themselves. Uh, and so he really started on the Bobby Kennedy campaign. He worked for the Edmund Muskie campaign, I was saying. Edmund Muskie, for those of you under 800 uh, years old, was a senator from Maine who who was knocked out of this, how far we've come in politics. He was knocked out of the Democratic Party because he appeared to be crying uh, while telling a story. Mm -hmm. And Mark said, yeah, I was the campaign strategist who told him to show a little emotion, and he yeah. cried. And <laughs> you know, thinking back, I, I bet that every time Mark Shields referred to Bobby Kennedy, he got a lump in his throat. He got, he got a lump in his throat. Yeah, that, Bobby emotion. Kennedy was his faux ideal of, yeah. of what a, a politician should yeah. be. So here's an easy one. Um, what is your personal philosophy on how to find meaning in your life? And I don't know if it, if it really means in your life or one's life, but you can take that either, either way. Um, you wrote yeah, a book I, about this, but. I did write a book, so I should remember what I said. Um, my, you know, my, my basic view is uh, most of us um, uh, make four significant commitments in our lives. Uh, most of us to some sort of family or intimate structure, most of us to a philosophy or faith, most of us to a community, uh, and most of us to um, a faith or creed. And so how you make and execute on those commitments will determine the quality of your life. And so my def definition of a commitment is falling in love with something and then building a structure of behavior around it for those moments when love falters. So Jews love their God, but they keep kosher just in case. So you have to have that structure of commitment so you stay faithful to what you promised to. And a lot of life is promising to what you promised before. And so for any college student side, this is my little riff on for college students. Around here, you probably spend a lot of time thinking about your vocation. But I can tell you that through the rest of your life, and I'm just gonna rely on social science data, that's not my opinion, your vocation and how you do in your career will be very important to your personal happiness and fulfillment. Your marriage will be four times more important. Uh, or it can be a marriage, it could be intimate commitments, I'm not judging what kind of, but your family. And so when you're in college, in my view, I'm gonna give advice to the president here, every course at Rhodes College should be about how to choose a marriage partner. <laughs> You should read George Eliot, Jane Austen, go with the experts. They really know what they're talking about. The neuroscience of marriage, the philosophy of marriage, the history of marriage. Um, it's just super important. And I, I tell my students, you know, marriage is a 50-year conversation. Marry somebody you can talk to for the rest of your life. Admiration, go, love comes and goes, but admiration stays. Marry somebody you can really admire. And so I give my kids all these advice on how to think about this. And they say, well, marriage is a box that'll come in the mail when I'm 35, I'm not gonna think about it. And a lot of them tell me, I'm too busy with my studies to have a romantic relationship. And I say, wrong. 
<laughs> you should have romantic relationships because you'll learn a lot about yourself. You'll learn how to be in a relationship. You'll learn how to build a relationship. You'll learn how to suffer when you end a relationship. And I remember my horrible sophomore year Chicago breakup way more than I do most of my courses, sorry. <laughs> uh, it was a real education. Uh, and so that's my little sermon to the young. Right. So somebody chose uh, economics and uh, neuroscience, I would say, for 400. What, if anything, is a remedy to inherited elitism, especially since parents want the best for their children? Yeah. It goes I mean, back to the meritocracy. When I talked about the flaws of the meritocracy, I, I don't blame the Bobos for investing in their kids. We all invest in our kids. So it wasn't malevolent. Mm -hmm. uh, it just had bad social effects. Uh, and so I guess my definition, my view is that we are in the midst or at the cusp of a giant change in the definition of the meritocracy. So the history of the meritocracy is a history of changing definitions of what merit is. And so as I mentioned earlier, in 1950, the definition of merit was your last name was Peabody Throgmorton. And you were part of that wasp, it was your blood. Then starting in 1950, they decided at Harvard and Yale and places like that, they decided, no, we're going to admit any of the smartest kids we can. And so, you know, SAT scores went up from 550 to 700 within 10 years. And so the definition willy-nilly of the meritocracy was cognitive ability, IQ, and your ability to please teachers between the ages of 15 and 18. What society organizes their whole sorting system on the ability to please teachers between age 15 and 18? It's crazy. What society organizes an admissions process, and here I'm trampling on every admissions officer in America, <laughs> on GPA? GPA is the ability to be pleasing across a range of fields all, so you can get straight A's. I guarantee you life is not like that. You just have to be really good at one thing. <laughs> so students who get A in one thing and F's in everybody else, they're the successes. I can tell you, from, again, social science research, there is zero correlation between academic success in college and success in life. And so, in my view, we're in the cusp of redefining what merit is. Uh, and so, obviously, the cognitive ability is important, maybe the most important thing, IQ, is super important. But a couple things I think are gonna change how we think about that. One is AI. We define merit as things machines can't do. But if machines can do raw processing power, then maybe our raw processing power won't be as important. Second, the Supreme Court threw out affirmative action, and so colleges have to redefine, well, how do we think about how we create a class? Third, the populist revolt against the educated class has really become dangerous for our society. And so we have maybe a multiplicity of definitions of merit so it doesn't all involve getting into a college, getting a white collar job, and having a certain sort of career. We have different versions of what success looks like. And so to me, all those things are really gonna radically change our definition of merit. And I was with a group of business people yesterday, and I asked them, how often, when you have to fire somebody, how often is it because they lack intelligence or they lack skills? Never. If you have to fire somebody, it's because they're not a good team player, or they don't know how to be coached. It's a moral failure, it's not a, cognitive failure. Uh, and so though we have to somehow find a way to organize our sorting system around the things that we actually think matter most. Being generous of spirit, being sensitive to other people, knowing how to work hard, knowing how to be calm in a crisis. These are basically um, a set of traits that maybe it's impossible to measure with numbers. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, I think we just have to have a, a, another version of the meritocracy going forward. One, uh, one last question, David, We've, we're at our, our time. Could you say a bit more about your essay, The Feminine Way to Wisdom, and what your writing process uh, was like as you were yeah. doing it? What inspired you to write it? Yeah, I, I, this is a book that I wrote um, this is, um, that shows what a really accomplished writer I am. I publish mag articles in my wife's magazine. Uh, so my wife runs a magazine called Comment, so I wrote this article for Comment. And it, we were talking about the 
these three women, I mentioned one, Eddie Hillisom, uh, and then Simone Weil and Edith Stein, who were all born in Jewish homes, living through the Holocaust and World War II, uh, and then, but all of whom went from being shallow, self-absorbed, to being um, just tremendously powerful. And in each case, they did it by changing the way they looked at people. And they, they developed this ability, uh, as Simone Weil is, that attention is the ultimate moral, moral act, and that prayer is condensed attention. I once saw a quote, uh, we're in a former church um, from Mother Teresa, and Dan Rather was interviewing her, and Rather said, uh, what do you say when you pray to God? And Mother Teresa said, I don't say anything, I just listen. And he said, well, what does God say to you when you pray to God? And she said, well, God just listens. <laughs> and, and, and if you can't understand it, I can't explain it to you. <laughs> and, and so th there's something spiritually beautiful about that comment. I've never put it in an article or anything. But, um, but so I was, I was just, I'm obsessed with people who are transformed and who have a, a soul that's closed over that is suddenly spiritually opened up and an illumination comes out of them. And I will say, I, you know, my wife, the one word everybody uses about her, my wife slash editor, um, is incandescent. She just sort of radiates, and she would say, she's a Christian, she would say, it, it's, the illumination is not her, it's the Holy Spirit. And we have a friend whose name is Pancho Aguilas, who helps uh, paralyzed, uh, mostly undocumented workers in Texas who've been paralyzed in construction accidents, he gives them wheelchairs and diapers and catheters. He turns them into social workers. So if you're in Houston, you'll have 25 Hispanic guys wheeling in your neighborhood to help clean up your neighborhood. Beautiful guy. And I, I once asked him, like, I just said to him, you radiate holiness. And he said, no, I reflect holiness, which is the right answer. And so I was just interested by that subject. But I want to close with just saying something about my writing process, because it might be interesting to people. Uh, writers love to talk about their craft. Mm -hmm. And so I um, mentioned uh, at lunch today, I, I was seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear. I decided at that moment I wanted to become a writer. Uh, and I've written probably every day since. And I write from, when we got married, my wife and I imagined that I would have, we would have these long, luxurious breakfasts talking about world affairs. But I really don't talk to another human being until I've written a thousand words. And so I go to my office, uh, and it used to be I would wear a Fitbit, and it would tell me I was napping between 8 and 12.30. <laughs> but I wasn't napping. I was doing whatever God wanted me to do. Like, so I'm really calm. I was calm. But the way I, I work is that I have a pretty bad short-term memory. And so I write everything down on Post-it notes. Or I, for a column, I print out 200 pages of things, and I mark up the pages. And then I've got this big stack. And I have my living room floor. And I start organizing this big stack of paper into piles. And so for one column, there'll be 14 piles. And each pile is a paragraph of that column. So to me, the writing process is not tapping into a computer. It's crawling around the floor, <laughs> organizing my files. <laughs> and uh, my wife will come in and see they're just papers. Like, and I need to see it geographically for it to be coherent. And so I pick up a pile, I write the paragraph, throw out those papers, pick up the next pile, write the paragraph. And so I tell my students, writing is about traffic management and structure. Mm -hmm. If you don't get the structure right, it'll just be so much harder to write. But if you can get it point, 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 and then if you get it in a narrative flow, and whenever I have difficulty making a point, I go to narrative, I go to hist chronological. I always wanted to be telling a story. Uh, and so in, in, a, in a book, I'll have, in a column, which is 860 words, I'll have 14 piles. For a book, I'll have a couple thousand piles. And so it's all just me on the floor crawling around. <laughs> uh, and so that's how I wrote that piece and every other piece I've ever written. So. Um a few days ago, I was getting ready for class early in the morning at my kitchen table, having coffee, and my wife was having coffee and reading the 
reading the paper on her phone, and, and then suddenly she came over brandishing her iPhone. I never thought you could brandish anything <laughs> else than a gun, but you can brandish an iPhone. In, in my face saying, it was uh, after reading your um, column on Mitt Romney, and she said, you see, David Brooks is always right. <laughs> and it wasn't like, I'm in denial about that. <laughs> go around the house, uh, you know, uh, criticizing you, but um, that must be a burden to. to oh, it's know, a terrible to, burden. To yeah. And uh, every time, every time I hear you, though, um, it sounds good to me. I remember in early 2015 saying, you know, I think that Donald Trump guy is going to get elected president. I remember. I remember. No, I, I wrote. <laughs> I wrote 800 columns saying, no, he'll never get be elected, he'll never get the Republican nomination. But I was living in DC, my social life was in New York, I was teaching at Yale. How could I be out of touch with America? Like, you know. <laughs> Thanks so much for being with us, David, and um, we'll see you before the bicentennial. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.